The force required to modify the speed or direction of a flowing fluid has been used in one way or another for many centuries. The common lawn sprinkler is the modern counterpart of an ancient Greek steam toy. To prevent a similar movement of hydroelectric penstocks, the forces it bends must be absorbed by tremendous concrete anchors. If such forces are not statically counterbalanced, as in the sprinkler or this runaway balloon, then a useful means of propulsion is at hand. As a matter of fact, the reaction to jet formation is not only the most popular form of propulsion today, but in simplified terms, it is a noteworthy example of the intersignificance of the three flow relationships. Whereas space rockets, like the runaway balloon, carry their own fluid to eject, terrestrial jets, whether air or water, can take in at the front what they later eject at the rear in accordance with continuity requirements. In this cutaway model of a simplified jet engine pod, the propeller operates in a larger section than if it were in the open, and hence, as seen from the continuity and energy equations, at lower velocity and higher pressure. For comparable reasons, the high velocity jet will emerge from the rear of the enclosed unit at the same pressure as the surrounding fluid. However, the unit will be displaced in the opposite direction by the reaction to the force required to change the flow from low to high velocity in accordance with the momentum equation. In actual operation, this forward thrust is balanced by the drag exerted by the surrounding flow as simulated by the experimental stream of this air tunnel. The first use of the lifting vane principle occurred many centuries ago in the connection with the windmill forerunners of the more recent airplane propeller shown here. Since each radial section of a propeller moves with a different velocity, for efficient design, the blade as a whole must vary continuously in shape from tip to hub. Each successive element of the blade has the same forward speed, but a tangential speed that is proportional to the radius. Hence, each will have a different angle of advance, and this in turn makes necessary a variable angle of the blade. For the single blade element now shown, the forward speed and the tangential speed determine its direction of motion relative to the fluid. This and the geometry of the element then control the angle of attack. The lift and drag, measured relative to the direction of motion, evidently both contribute to the axial thrust of the propeller and to the tangential force that is involved in the torque. A ship propeller usually has blades of large cord, so that the load is distributed over a greater area. Thus, the local pressure drop will normally not be great enough to produce cavitation. Here, however, tests conducted under extreme conditions in a cavitation tunnel of the Navy's David Taylor Model Basin show by water vapor formation a decrease in slipstream diameter that must always occur as the propeller accelerates the passing fluid. When the same state of flow is seen in slow motion, the tip vortex is found to yield a spiral tube of water vapor, which shows the actual complexity of the slipstream. Encasing a propeller in a duct, as in a pump or turbine, eliminates both the tip effect and the necking down of the slipstream. The pitch of the blades is often variable, from the braking limit to full feather, in order to control the efficiency and other operating characteristics. Blowers, pumps, and turbines vary from the axial flow or propeller type just shown to the radial flow or centrifugal type of this Alice Chalmers turbine. A radial flow unit is shown schematically in the laboratory. The blue stationary guide vanes give the oncoming flow a tangential component, which ideally is brought again to zero by the time the flow leaves the red vanes of the moving runner. The work that is done by the fluid on the runner 
is proportional to the change in circulation that is produced. If the camera is now rotated at the same speed as the runner to show the flow relative to its blades, these are seen to act as lifting vanes, much like those previously discussed. The components of both lift and drag evidently control the tangential force on the runner that does the useful work. However, if the rate of flow, direction of approach, and runner speed are not properly related, an effect comparable to stall will occur, and the efficiency will be reduced. A fluid coupling, which serves as a shock-free connection between driving and driven machinery, consists of a pump, the green shaft and blades at the left, and a turbine, the blue shaft and blades at the right, compactly combined in a single housing. If the space is filled with a fluid of appreciable density, turning the input shaft and blades will cause the output blades and shaft to yield the same torque, whether rotating or stalled, because the circulation must increase and decrease by the same amount as the fluid passes from one side to the other and back again. Inclusion of a set of stationary vanes, here shown in red, permits the circulation to be changed without doing work, so that the output vanes will yield a higher or lower torque. Such a unit is called a torque converter. Proper shape of the stationary vanes will even permit the output torque to be reversed in sign. The general principle of using stationary guide vanes, visible in the upper portion of this open model of an aircraft jet engine, as well as moving blades, is the basis of most propulsive machinery. Though the elements are carefully shaped and used in many successive stages, they are all basically lifting vanes. Here, however, not only the density and viscosity of the gaseous fluid must be considered, but also its compressibility. 